Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to begin thinking about streams and flooding. So the first thing we're going to consider is what is a drainage network and this is going to correspond to section 16.1 of your textbook. So a drainage network as the name suggests, is a network of river channels which are used to drain water from a set area of the Earth's surface. So the first thing we need to think about is, well, why are geologists so obsessed with running water on the surface of the Earth? And it's actually quite simple. When it comes down to it, moving water is arguably the most important agent for the erosion of rocks, the transportation of sediment, and the deposition of sediment. So geologists, especially sedimentary geologists, spend a lot of time thinking about running water. And arguably the main way in which water moves across the surface of the Earth is in the form of rivers. So that obviously brings us to the next question, which is, what is a river? Well, a river is defined as a body of running water, and this running water is confined to a channel. The water will run downhill, and it will run downhill typically because it's going from a point of high elevation to a point of low elevation. So gravity is helping to influence that flow. And we can actually see that here in this diagram. You can see here we have two separate rivers, and you can see the source of the river is going to be up here in the elevated terrain, and essentially it's going to be moving downhill into this lower terrain area down here. So in terms of rivers themselves, they come in two main forms. There are perennial rivers, which will flow all year round. And those are the ones we're familiar with. Think of a river like the Mississippi, for instance. And there will also be ephemeral rivers. And these rivers tend to exist only for short periods of time. So they can be due to things like large thunderstorms or maybe snow melting you know, during the spring, creating a load of water coming down off the mountains. The river temporarily exists and then once the water is you know, lost because the ice stops melting, it's done. And in terms of where our river is going to get its water from, it's going to get it from two main sources. If your river happens to sit below the water table, so that's the level of water in the ground, then water will naturally move from the ground into the river via, essentially through the river banks. The other way that you can get water in your river is in the form of runoff, and this is where water moves across the surface of the earth. So just think of your road during a very large thunderstorm. You can see the water moving down the side of your road as it flows towards a drain. That is runoff, just water moving across the surface of the earth. So your river will be getting water from two different sources, and it depends on the depth of your river relative to the water table. If your river is at or below the water table, then water will naturally flow in from the water table into the river. But if your river is above the water table, then it's going to primarily rely on water coming from runoff. So that's the water moving across the surface of the earth. So in terms of where this water comes from, it comes from an area of the earth's surface which we refer to as a drainage basin. And this is the area which is, as the name suggests, drained by an individual river. So if we look at this diagram here, you can see we have two separate rivers and two separate drainage basins. So we have a river over here on the left and a river over here on the right. And we can see the areas which are drained by these rivers. The left-hand river essentially drains this area marked out here in red and the right-hand river drains this area marked out here in blue. And so these areas of the earth's surface where the river is collecting its water from is referred to that river's drainage, uh, referred to as that river's drainage basin. Now, the contact between drainage basin marks a point where water can go either way. So, if you imagine a drop of rain hitting this orange line right here, well, in theory, it could go this way into the left-hand drainage basin, or it could go this way into the right-hand drainage basin. So these boundaries essentially mark a point typically of high relief which separates drainage basins. And this line is given a number of different terms. Sometimes it's referred to as the drainage divide, sometimes it's referred to as the ridge line, and sometimes it's referred to as the watershed. But essentially all those terms mean the same thing. It's the boundary at which two separate drainage basins meet. 
So when analysing rivers, uh, geologists and sedimentologists especially will tend to think about hydrographs. So we're thinking about how the river is moving the water, how much water is moving through an area and at what speed is it moving through the area. And we plot this in the form of a hydrograph. So a hydrograph has two axes. On one axis we have time and on the other axis we have discharge. So now we need to define what discharge is. Well, discharge is simply the amount of water that's moving through a set area of your river during a set period of time. So what you have to do is you pick a point on your river and you calculate the area of your river at that location. And then simply you take that area, so area is going to be width multiplied by depth, and then you're going to multiply that value by the velocity of the water, and that's going to give you discharge. So typically, if the water in your river speeds up, the discharge is going to go up because the water is moving faster. So that's more water moving through a set point during a given period of time. On the other hand, if your river starts to become wider, well, that's also going to increase the discharge because you're going to get more water moving through that area because the area has gotten higher. And we'll put these uh, changes in the discharge of river in the form of the hydrograph. And so you can see this particular hydrograph here is showing a situation where we have a steady increase in discharge, a peak discharge, and then a decrease in discharge. And then we return back down here to our starting level. And this is a pretty standard hydrograph for a river that's having water enter it. And this could be water that's being produced by melting snow during the spring, or this could be water that's entering the river due to a thunderstorm, let's say. So, you know, you, you, you're, the rain comes down from the sky, it hits the ground. Typically, that water will take a little while to get into the river. And so as the water which is being dropped by the thunderstorm starts to enter the river, we see the discharge begin to increase because the volume of water in your river is getting higher. So the area is going to increase. And also typically that's going to lead to an increase in velocity. So your discharge is going to start creeping up. You're going to hit the peak discharge. And so that's the maximum discharge your river achieves. And then you're going to see the discharge decrease from there back to your starting level. Now, the shape of these hydrographs is going to vary depending on the situation. So it, it, depending on the shape of your drainage basin, should I say. So if your drainage basin exists in an area where you have steep slopes, any water that hits those steep slopes is naturally going to flow into your river quite quickly because it's going to be dropping down quite a steep slope. So it's going to move quite fast. And so this means that water which is deposited in areas or drainage basins that have steep slopes are going to produce much greater peak discharges. So imagine if your thunderstorm is occurring here, your rain starts hitting the ground. Once again, it doesn't go straight into the river. It has to move across the surface of the earth. So there's a bit of a lag between the rain falling and the river discharge starting to increase. And so this is our lag here we can see the discharge starts to go up very very quickly because that water is moving very very fast into our river because of the steep gradient we hit our peak discharge right here and then the discharge drops down very quickly on the other side because the water's entered the river very very fast and then that's it in contrast, if your drainage basin has more gentle slopes to it, it's going to take longer for the water to enter the river. And so what we're going to see in this instance is we're going to see a peak discharge which is lower than the steep slope because the water is spread out over a longer time period, so that means the discharge can't get as high. But it does mean that because the entrance of the water into the river is spread out over a longer period of time, it means the peak discharge is going to be much, much longer in duration. So you're going to get a lower but much broader peak. Now, as we've discussed, in terms of water entering rivers, most of what's going to affect the river's discharge is going to be runoff. So this is the water that's moving across the surface of the earth. So the more runoff that goes into your river, the faster that discharge is going to increase. And obviously, during, as I said, in, this, in an environment that has steep slopes, that water is going to move into your river very, very fast because that steep slope is going to naturally encourage that water to drop quickly. So it's going to have quite a high velocity. So another thing we need to think about when uh, discussing rivers is how the shape of the river, or more accurately, how the shape of the drainage basin is going to affect the hydrograph that we see. 
So this is the hydrograph we saw on the previous slide, and this is going to be the situation we get for a relatively simple river system. So if you imagine, once again, our rain falls, we have our lag between the rain falling and entering the river, we see our discharge increase, peak discharge is achieved, and then discharge drops back down. And this is a relatively simple hydrograph for a relatively simple river. Typically, you would expect this where you have a river that just has one channel, and typically you have several tributaries which are entering that river, providing the water to the main channel. Now, if on the other hand, your river has a more complex drainage basin, it can lead to uh, a lot of variation in your hydrograph because the water doesn't all arrive at one time. In some cases, it can arrive in several bursts. And so we'll see this in the form of hydrographs where we have these repeated peak discharges. And so that's because the water is entering the river through these three separate portions of the drainage basin. So we're going to see a peak associated with the water entering the main channel from this area, a peak associated with the water entering the main channel from this area, and a peak associated with the water entering the main channel from this area. So typically the more complex your drainage basin, the more complex your hydrographs are going to be. Now, when we talk about rivers, the thing we really have to focus on are, is the channel itself. And river channels are actually split uh, based on what we refer to as orders. And what happens is, is you start with the smallest rivers that are part of your drainage network. And these are going to be essentially the small channels that we can see here marked one. So these smaller channels will join together to provide water to a larger channel, which is uh, going to be a, essentially a second level channel. Then second level channels are going to join together to form third level channels and third level channels are going to join together to form fourth level, cha level channels and so on. So you can see that as we move from one level to another, the volume of water which is being transported in the channel is getting higher. So as you can, as you can probably guess, the discharge for this area here is going to be considerably higher than the discharge for this area over here. Now, these smaller rivers that feed the main channel are given a special term. They are termed tributaries. So we can see in this particular diagram, we have three tributaries feeding our main channel. One here, one here, and one here. And of course, this is going to be our main channel right here. And of course, water is going to be collected across all of this area into these tributaries, and these tributaries are going to provide water into the main channel. Now, because the water is entering through multiple tributaries, it means that typically the discharge is going to be spread out over a period of time. Because if you imagine we're monitoring the river right here, it's obviously going to take less time for the water to move from here to here versus water that's coming from here to here. And so this means that typically during a storm event, we will see the discharge going up and normally it will be a relatively broad peak because it takes a while for that water to actually make it into the main channel and to the point where we're actually monitoring the river itself. Now, the shape of the environment that the river is in is going to have an effect on the morphology or the, the design essentially of your drainage network. So the most common type of drainage network is what's referred to as a dendritic drainage network. So in the case of a dendri dendritic drainage network, we have one single channel, which you can see is the channel right here. So this is going to be the main channel. And the main channel is fed by numerous tributaries, typically in an area of higher elevation, so hills and mountains. And so this, if you look at it from the top down, gives your river an appearance a bit like a tree. And so that's why it's referred to as dendritic. Now, the next type of drainage pattern which we can see is what's called a radial pattern. And this is typically associated with areas where we have an isolated, area of elevated terrain. And the most common example of this would be something like a volcano. So here's our area of elevated terrain, possibly a volcano, and any area of elevated terrain is naturally going to become a focus for water to be deposited on. And this water can simply move across the surface in the form of liquid water, or maybe it falls in the winter in the form of snow and ice, and that gets incorporated into glaciers on, in this area of elevated terrain. So, of course, as the ice melts or as the water simply runs off the surface of the earth, it's going to flow down the sides of, an, of our area of elevated terrain. And so this means we're going to get multiple rivers forming essentially 
uh, at our area of elevated terrain and flowing away from it. And so this will create a situation where we have our central high and we have uh, rivers radiating away from this central high, a bit like spokes in a cartwheel. The final type of drainage network that we're going to come across on a regular basis is a structurally controlled drainage network. So this is the kind of drainage network system that you tend to see in the Appalachian area. So in this case, we have an effect of geology on the surface of the earth. So we can see that we have two ridges, one ridge running down here and one ridge running down here. And you can see that either side of each of these ridges, we have one river here, one river here, and one river here. So the existence of these ridges is a reflection of geology. So you can see, you can, well, you can see, you can probably assume that these ridges are going to be made up typically of rocks which will be quite hard to erode. Because they're more resistant to erosion, they are naturally going to erode more slowly, whereas the softer rocks either side are going to erode more quickly. So the erosion of the softer rocks is naturally going to create topographic lows along which water will preferentially channel itself because there'll be a depression. Now, in the case of what's causing these layers of rock to be in the position they're in, typically it's something to do with how the rocks are being deformed. So it could be to do with the way in which the rock is being faulted, so the rock is breaking and pieces of rock are moving relative to each other. That could, in theory, push rock up, creating a ridge like this. The other option is that the rock is actually being folded. So the rock is buckling, essentially a bit like bending a piece of paper. And so if you imagine a situation where we have a layer of rock and that layer of rock was initially it formed an arch shape. So our layer of resistant rock comes up here like this and it came down on the other side like so. And it formed an arch going from this point here to this point here. Now, the top of the arch has been eroded away and so is the core of the arch. But you can see the edges of the arch essentially in the form of these two ridges here. So the structural controls, as I say, can be due to faulting or folding of the, of the rock strata beneath the surface. But essentially what it does is it ends up creating uh, these uh, drainage divides. And you can see this has resulted in essentially rivers running parallel to each other with very short tributaries coming off the side. So if we look at this river here, this is a prime example of this kind of texture. So here's our river moving down this uh, valley. And you can see the area of elevated terrain along the side is going to be where the water is sourced from. And you can see you have lots of small tributaries which are feeding the main channel here. You can then see in the next valley we have the same thing, one main channel coming through with tributaries feeding the main channel. And then we have the same thing over here. And so this particular pattern of main rivers running parallel to each other and short tributaries coming off the side is often referred to as a trellis pattern or trellis drainage network. And this is commonly associated with areas of the earth where the path of the rivers is being affected by geology, so structural controls. Now, in terms of North, uh, North American drainage basins, there are, in theory, five of them. Now, the most famous uh, boundary between North American drainage basins is what's referred to as the Continental Divide, and it's running along here like so. So the Continental Divide essentially is the boundary uh, at which water on the western side will flow into the Pacific and water on the eastern side will typically flow into the Atlantic or the Arctic. So in terms of the areas which are drained and where that water is going, well, and surprisingly, this area in the center marked out here in red, well, this is going to be for the Gulf of Mexico drainage basin. So all the land in here, the water is collected into several major rivers, of which arguably the Mississippi is the best known. There's also other, other uh, rivers like the Ohio and the Missouri. And the water from these rivers is going to go into the main channel and it's going to be moved down into the Gulf of Mexico. On the western side here, we have the uh, Pacific Ocean drainage basin. So any water that falls into this green area is going to drain off to the west into the Pacific Ocean. Now, this area here is referred to as the interior drainage uh, basin because in this area we have water that's going to be coming into the drainage basin. So this essentially area here is a, is a bit of a topographic low. And because it's a low point, water will naturally flow into it. And so you'll see uh, small rivers flowing through this area and they'll be flowing into the interior drainage basin instead of out into the Pacific because the water is naturally going downhill into the interior drainage network.
Now, up here, typically in northern Canada, we have an area where uh, any liquid water is going to flow into the Arctic Ocean. Of course, it's going to be the Arctic Ocean drainage network. And over here in blue, we have the area where water is going to move through the drainage network and be deposited into the Atlantic. And of course, that's going to be the Atlantic Ocean drainage network. Now, on this side, of course, we have the continental divide that separates the Pacific Ocean drainage network from the Gulf of Mexico drainage network. But we also have another dr uh, drainage divide over here, which is represented by an area of high ground, in this case, the Appalachians. And this is referred to as the Eastern Continental Divide. So any water that falls on the western side of the Appalachians is going to go into the Gulf of Mexico drainage network. And any water that falls on the eastern side of the Appalachians is going to go into the Atlantic Ocean drainage network. All right. Thank you for watching, everybody, and have a good day.